The following contains depictions of abuse, assault, and references to sexual violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Greetings. My name is Darkwit. I'd like to try and do something a little bit different for a change. While I do lots of ASMR and hypnosis, I also hearken myself to be a storyteller. I'd like to read for you an excerpt from a story I've been writing for quite a while. It started as an attempt to better understand the nature of Darkwit and his themes. But there was one particular excerpt that I would like to share with you today. And potentially, I may adapt this to a full audio production in the distant future when I feel more confident and have more free time on my hands. <laughs> the themes in this excerpt are rather intense, so please listen responsibly. So, I present to you an excerpt from Darkwit and the Facilitators, Chapter 3, Cellophane. It is a colloquial adage to suggest this country exists as a melting pot, where cultures intermingle and blend in a fascinating, often unpredictable spectrum of ideas and traditions. But some echelons of society sequester themselves so totally that their ideals are beyond assimilation. For example, it has been suggested that the opulence of mega-wealth can alter a person's brain chemistry, making them virtually incapable of connecting to their fellow man. Some are hopelessly beyond the capacity for empathy or compassion for those less fortunate. If one spent so much time isolated from the mainstream, how alien would your most closely held tenets become to the average person? Such is the tragic enigma of the cult of the white eye. Their initial message was understandable, even admirable, that regardless of societal, cultural, or racial standing, one basic universal rule was not to be impeached, the sanctity of free will. Choice and self-determination are believed to be the virtues that separate the animal world from the civilized, that robbing someone of choice, or the capacity for choice, should be a crime considered with the same impunity as a rapist. Initially, the society spawned from the unfortunate victims that fell through the cracks. They restricted themselves to the rule of law, only to find a system rigged against retribution for the people in power. Arguably, the first true member was Samantha Tabert, an albino chinchilla who worked for Mel Grayson, the heir to a self-help and wellness empire. She was glad to work for someone who lived in what could have been described as a homeopathic palace. He was eccentric, even admitted the reason he hired her was for her aura and her distinct, vibrant red eyes. But the pay was excellent and the living conditions comfortable. As time went on, Mr. Grayson's demands became increasingly strange. He would request odd deliveries, expect her to stay around for late hours, even have her clean up against get-togethers with his friends involving illicit substances. Such was the life of the wealthy, and Samantha was fine to endure it, until she heard the telltale sound of uncontrollable sobbing behind a locked door. Mr. Grayson was not a successful romantic. His closely held belief that he was a descendant of ancient royalty and other delusions of grandeur had made most shy away from him after a short while. But his latest catch was not someone he wanted to let go. For several weeks she was held against her will, and Samantha was expected to care for her. She would have protested, but to go against her employer did not just mean losing her job. It also meant losing her home and any kind of stability in her life. She was forced to endure the non-choice of imprisoning someone 
or to destroy her life. It ate at her to hear the pleading from the young woman, offers of money, accusations of morals no better than her employer, desperate begging to let her family know she was all right, assaulted her during the day, and tormented her sleep at night. His sociopathic crime slowly distilled her once comfortable life as an assistant into a toxic hell of abuse and accessory. Her mind retreated into itself, going through the motions and simply doing as she was told, anything to maintain the status quo, for fear of her boss taking it out on her if his victim escaped. She was a good assistant, so long as she did as she was told. And yet, she was offered a sliver of choice, if albeit passively. It was only a key left inattentively on a food tray. Samantha was convinced it was an accident, but who can really say? The woman escaped, and Mr. Grayson was sent to trial. Samantha testified in court to a jury of utterly deaf ears. The natural charisma of Mel Grayson and the legacy of his father made him too pretty, too influential, and too rich to throw into prison. Even reporters breathlessly spoke of how the Graysons helped them live better lives in the same sentence as they reported of his crimes. He walked free, accusing Samantha for her overzealous insistence on protecting his identity. The imprisoned woman even took the opportunity to run her 15 minutes of fame to profit off of her trauma, writing a book and becoming a bestseller. His reputation was tarnished, but Mel would survive. But what of the albino chinchilla? She did as she was told, and was shunned by both assailant and victim. She was denied a choice and punished for her blind obedience. She was without a job, a home, an accessory to imprisonment. Everyone else had made their choice, except for her. It was fitting that the first choice she made in years would be her last. As on the last day of trial, she said goodbye to Mr. Grayson in the form of a gift. A fountain pen shoved into his jugular. Something had snapped in Samantha, something she would never get back, because when they took her mugshot for processing, her vibrant, trademark red gaze was gone. In their stead was a pair of milky white eyes. A select group of people were inspired by her story, while the rest of society shunned Samantha for her psychotic break, others decried she was a victim of a system that failed her. Dedicated followers in white hoodies and masks broke her from her prison so she could live free. But she wasn't interested in such things. She only had one thing to tell her followers. Never let them take your right to choose. She became a leader of wayward souls, following her example to work outside the law regardless of life and limb. They held on to her ideals and chose to go after the people denying others the right to choose. It didn't matter if they were protected by the law or wealth or just the court of public opinion. If they robbed others of their freedom, their fate was sealed. Their organization became a harrowing whisper in the world of the elite, turned to myth as their ideals became more and more extreme. They discovered there was an even more select elite utilizing forms of mind control, hypnosis, gaslighting, and brainwashing. It sent the wide eye into radicalization. If their enemies were enacting that kind of control over others, their own members could have betrayed them. For a few years, the wide eye devolved into paranoia and zealotry. The more rational members were deemed compromised or not dedicated enough and wiped out, until all that was left was the most deluded of their acolytes. 
committing to invasive procedures and dangerous hypnotic reinforcement to ensure that any attempts to break them from their mission or free them from their established ideals would be met with blind, violent rage. All Samantha could do was watch behind her dead white eyes as she grew older and her children became more unhinged. By her seventies, her most devoted lieutenants evangelized her message, and she had grown far too tired to try and guide them away from this path. On her deathbed, she uttered a single sentence to the next leader of the wide eye that would never be repeated again. I never chose this. Thank you for listening. Let me know if these little narrated excerpts were appealing to you.